And now without further ado, I'd love to introduce our first speaker for today. Our first speaker earned their PhD in computer science at Stanford, where he started and led the Snorkel Open Source Project. He's an assistant professor in computer science at the University of Washington, and he's also the CEO and co-founder of Snorkel. Please welcome to the stage, Alex Ratner. Hey everyone, how's it going? I'm already seeing some familiar names and some new ones in the chat, so it's, it's incredibly exciting and humbling to have all of you joining for today. And hopefully this gives, uh, and this talk in particular gives a little bit of an overview of, of some of the themes that we hope to, uh, to, to propagate and to bring up here, as well as uh, some of the work that we're doing uh, at Snorkel and, and over the project over the last couple of years that has led us at least to this perspective. And we're so excited to get to uh, present and also hear from all of you, you know, why you're here and, and, and how uh, you know, your experiences and, and current trajectories relate to this, this, uh, this big shift that we're talking about. So without further ado, let's uh, jump into the slides. Awesome. And so today I'm gonna have uh, uh, these first 30 minutes just to give an overview of some of our perspective on the broad trend that is this uh, data-centric AI development shift, as well as some of the work that we've done around it, uh, both to provide context on where some of the uh, the snorkel folks uh, that you'll hear from today get their perspective as well as to give an example of a, a data-centric AI system and, and approach. But again, super excited to hear from all of you and from all of the wonderful speakers. So just to give a little bit of a preview, uh, I won't run through this all, but we have a ton of really exciting uh, perspectives. This includes things on, on methodological advances, self-supervision, multitask learning, transfer learning, um, uh, includes applications in real world practice, system design considerations throughout the, the machine learning life cycle. So lots of exciting stuff and you can check out the agenda at future.snorkel.ai as well as um, lots more data, lots, lots more in terms of resources uh, on, on the Snorkel website. Okay, so I'm gonna start with a, uh, what might be an, an apropos topic, which is, you know, what, is, what does data centric AI mean? In particular, it might sound a little bit tautological if you think, well, you know, AI, or at least what we often refer to as AI these days, which, you know, today largely we, we mean machine learning, is all about data. It always has been about data. So what do we mean by this being a, a shift or, or a new focus? So I'll start by, you know, contrasting with where AI and machine learning specifically has been from a development perspective for, for many years. And this is what we often refer to as model-centric development. And in the model-centric development world, uh, which you know, often I, I like to refer to as you know, kind of the, the Kaggle challenge or ImageNet world, you're largely considering the uh, training data that your model is learning from. And today we'll largely, at least in this talk, I'll be talking largely about supervised learning. So imagine you know, some data points with labels, imagine some contracts or chest X-rays or network flows with some label that you want to train a model to predict. So your training data is uh, in the supervised paradigm, is a bunch of data with the kind of ground truth label and your machine learning model uh, or your, you know, they're not at all synonymous, what's largely used synonymously today, the AI uh, model, is going to fit to that or learn from that labeled training data. And so this is a little bit caricatured, but in the model-centric AI development uh, approach, you're, you're largely treating the training data as exogenous from your ML development process. It's something that you, you know, download as a CSV file when you start your Kaggle competition or uh, you uh, start your, your academic experiments against one of the benchmark data sets like ImageNet. And then you're largely iterating uh, via changes to the model. And, and I use model in the broad sense that includes feature engineering, algorithm design, bespoke architecture design, et cetera. So you're really living in the model and treating the data as a static artifact. And often there's a, a kind of sense that the data set is something that is outside of the AI development process or, or before the AI development process. And we'll touch on that again. And one thing I wanna emphasize throughout this talk is that this, this shift from model-centric to data-centric AI development is as much a, a kind of shift in the, in, in the focus of the ML community and culture as it is a technological or methodological shift. It's about viewing this, this data as a more central figure and first-class citizen of the development process. So skipping over why exactly this, this has happened, which we'll get to shortly, uh, but just going right to the what, Data centric in, in contrast basically means that uh, you're spending more of your time in a relative sense on the data, labeling, managing, slicing, augmenting, curating. And the model may also be under development, but is often relatively fixed. And in this data centric world that we're increasingly seeing out in the space of AI applications, the data 
is the key differentiator or, or arbiter of your success or failure. And it's therefore the key focus of iterative development. And so that is a very high level sense of what we mean by, by data centric AI development. And of course, it's, it's very important before I, I jump back in and, and, you know, you know, proceed bombastically with extolling the, uh, the importance and virtues of data centric AI to say that it's, of course, not an either or. Successful AI development requires both models and data, obviously, and it requires iteration on both. Uh, but rather what we're bringing folks together to talk about today and, and what underscores a lot of the work that you're going to hear about both from me now, but today throughout the, uh, the summit is that, you know, this relative shift to data being the core bottleneck and the core focus is a real fundamental one, even though it's a relative one. And it really changes how we develop and deploy AI and the systems and techniques we use. And before I jump in, I'm going to go through what will serve as an outline for this, this overview talk and uh, what we refer to as kind of principles of data centric AI. And originally, you know, uh, circa 2015, 2016, when we were starting a lot of our work, in particular, the Snorkel project, uh, which, uh, again, lots of lots of resources if you want to dive into some of the technical underpinnings or the theoretical underpinnings, uh, lots more stuff on the on the resources page in our website or Google Scholar. But at a very high level. These principles back when we started uh, at, at the Stanford AI Lab were, were really hypotheses. And so whether you think of them as hypotheses or, or as principles, there's three that we'll focus on today. First is the one that I sort of uh, already uh, covered, which is that AI development today increasingly centers around the data, uh, the training data especially. The second hypothesis or principle of data-centric AI is that if data is the fulcrum point, is the center of AI development workflows, the interface to it needs to be something better than just manually labeling and curating one data point at a time. In other words, there needs to be some kind of programmatic interface to actually driving this data centric development, if it's going to be practical and, and feasible in real world settings. And finally, data centric AI, i.e. AI development workflows that revolve around the data, actually uh, have to include the people who know about the data and know how to label it and know how to sample it, know how to construct the relevant subsets of it or slices of it. And we'll refer to these folks as, as the subject matter experts. And obviously the subject matter expert and the data scientist can be one person, but we'll, we'll refer to them as, as two separate folks because they often are in, and their collaboration is, is central to data centric AI actually functioning. Okay, so we'll go through each of these three principles or hypotheses and talk a little bit about why they're important, what they really mean, and how they change the way that you actually go about developing AI and the platforms and systems you use to do that development and deployment. So again, just to dig in a little deeper uh, about uh, what you know, ML development you know, still is in many settings where it makes sense, and, but in, increasingly was the, the dominant mode, uh, this, this model-centric development cycle. And again, in this setting, the data is largely something that is thought of as outside of or before the core development process. And instead, you're often just, you know, you're spending most of your time iterating on the data. I guess I should phrase this in proper kind of, you know, population statistics terms. So what we mean by, uh, you know, previously being model centric is if you went to a, a uh, you know, ML team in industry or in some production setting five plus years ago, and you said, what is the primary thing that you spend your time working on? Five plus years ago, 95% of people would say the model. And in particular, they'd be working on things like feature engineering, which is selecting, you know, the specific uh, attributes or features of the data that the model is actually uh, looking at and, and learning weights or, uh, or parameters over. It's the model architecture design, so the actual structure of those, those weights or parameterizations of the, of the features that get fed in as input. The algorithms for training these bespoke model architectures. And all of these pieces were the subject and still are the subject of, of you know, vast amounts of research, but they were, you know, uh, the, or, or they are the primary uh, kind of toolkit and, and uh, focus of a development when you're thinking in this model centric development perspective. So what happened? Well, one of the big trends that's, that's uh, uh, caused a sea change in how machine learning is done is this shift from uh, models that are largely based on manual feature engineering and that uh, in other words, don't learn their own representations to representation are often, uh, you know, this is used synonymously with deep learning models of today. And without going into depth there, the big shift in a practical sense, and I'm really going to stay high level in this talk and, and really talk about practical imports and themes, is that today's models are much, much more powerful 
and much more push button because they take in raw data largely and they learn features or representations themselves and they get new state-of-the-art scores, but they're uh, far less uh, easy uh, to, to directly modify and they're far more data hungry. And that last one is important and without going into you know, some of the, the, the theory that is still being repaired by their emergence and, and, and you know, adapted to some of their new emergent properties, at a very high level, you know, these models have you know, hundreds of millions of free parameters that need to be learned from data rather than you know, thousands. And therefore, they're commensurately more data hungry and they need that much more labeled training data in general to get uh, peak performance. It's also worth noting a really uh, exciting trend is that these, these model architectures are increasingly convergent and commoditized or accessible. So if any of you have been following ML Twitter and, and seeing the latest uh, uh, variants of everything is a transformer uh, on, on, you know, in, in the latest uh, uh, paper submissions, whether it's a transformer or some other architecture, an increasing diversity of tasks and data modalities are all being handled by an increasingly small and stable set of model architectures. And again, what this means is that these model architectures are better supported, they're more push button. You know, you can uh, run one of them in a line or two of Python these days, thanks to some of the great efforts of, of both the community and, and, uh, um, and, and various companies in the space. They're far more accessible in other words, but they're also far less practically modifiable. In other words, it's very difficult as you know, an AI practitioner to sit down and say, okay, here's some error mode that my model is having, let me go and make a tweak to the you know, third multi-headed attention unit to correct for that. They're kind of black boxes, amazing, powerful, uh, well-supported and well-engineered black boxes, but uh, very difficult to, to directly modify. And of course, back to that second thing that was mentioned, they're increasingly data hungry. So the training data, the volume, but also the quality, the management, the distribution and sampling is increasingly the arbiter of whether uh, they're successful or not. And you can even see this reflected in the state-of-the-art literature. You often see uh, the progress these days on state-of-the-art benchmark tasks is more about creative ways to collect more data, to augment or transform or boost it, to utilize other sources of signal more effectively versus a, a new model architecture. So in other words, if you look at ML development today, a lot of the key operations that you used to have in your toolkit and, and used to be the mainstay of what you actually did as an ML or AI developer, feature engineering, model architect architecture design, training algorithm design, are really not uh, uh, what you focus on or what's highest leverage to focus on or even what you can practically focus on to iterate. And instead, um, you know, what ends up taking up all of your time because of this commensurate need for lots and lots of label training data is everything around the data, training data collection, labeling, augmentation, slicing, management. So to return back to that, that statement earlier, if you go to an average ML development team today, what we're seeing, at least from our perspective in the space, is that an average team will say, we're stuck on and we're spending our time on the data, much more so than the models. And so data is both the key bottleneck, but also really the emerging interface to how you actually iterate on and develop AI today. And obviously all that was high level, but again, I'm, I'm giving a preview for some of the great more in-depth talks that you'll hear throughout the day today. Also, it looks like there's some uh, connection issues, but I'm sure those will be taken care of in the chat and we'll be able to share this afterwards if not. Okay, so second principle is about data-centric AI development needing to be programmatic, or in other words, higher level than just uh, manual manipulations and curation of, of data points. And this is underscored by a reality that is that is increasingly known throughout the industry, which is that a lot of AI progress is, is blocked by needing to label and curate and manage training data. So in some settings, you see this problem being tackled by employing armies of human labelers, you know, think in the self-driving world, labeling stop signs or pedestrians with, with lots and lots of manual effort, you know, clicking on one image at a time. But for the majority of the use cases that are out there where AI has an incredible promise, where all the tools, the teams, the models are kind of on standby, it often takes you know, entire quarters or even person years to go through and label and manage data to actually be ready for machine learning development, especially in settings as we'll get to later where uh, data is uh, very difficult or expensive to label. So I'll give one example about this. This is a bit old, but it's one of my, my favorite ones because it, it's, a, it's a, a great use case we partnered on uh, back in the Stanford days with 
the Stanford Radiology Department and the VA healthcare system. And uh, without going into the de details, that the task here is classifying uh, medical modalities like, say, chest X-rays for whether they need to be urgently triaged by a human or not. So this is a uh, an analyst assist or a human assist ML deployment, not replacement, and it's also uh, motivated by, you know, for example, low resource hospital systems where, um, you know, there is a limited supply of, of human attention to go around, so it needs to be prioritized correctly. Anyway, if you're curious about the details, again, you can check out the resources and, and, and see some of the papers around this. But I want to pull out just a few quick stats that are very exemplary of this, this data-centric bottleneck in reality today, which is that our collaborators in this project spent about a day or two trying, I think, five or six of the state-of-the-art image classification model architectures at the time. And again, it really only took them a day or two you know, under a couple hundred lines of Python to try all of these out. And they found that there was under a point of difference in the score we were optimizing for it, between, you know, the, the top of the leaderboard and the fifth model on the leaderboard. In other words, the difference from the model architectures, which all actually performed quite well, was fairly minimal. In contrast, the data, the labeled training data to actually get this model to perform well was, uh, you know, immensely impactful. It took eight to 14 person months of Stanford radiologist time just clicking one by one on data points. And the difference between a little bit of that data and the full data set uh, was on average 10 to 100x greater than what model architecture you used. So again, this just underscores this, this theme that while obviously the model in, 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 you know, in an obvious sense is still the star of the show and still critical, the leverage, the highest leverage point is usually in many applications today, the data how much of it, how it's labeled, how it's managed, how it's partitioned and augmented, et cetera, versus what particular model architecture you use. Uh, but you know, getting that labeled data, as we kind of hinted at in that example, in most real world settings is very difficult. Real world use cases generally require subject matter expertise. You need uh, a legal analyst or a financial analyst or a doctor or a government analyst or a network technician or the list goes on to actually do this data labeling and curation. So it's, it's you know, and often these people need to be specially trained for the data set and, and use case at hand. So there are often people inside your organization that you have to you know, beg for some of their time, not just people that can be you know, hit via an API. Real world data is often highly private and can't just be shipped out uh, to anyone to go label. And real world data and objectives for what you want to model with that data often change rapidly. So often both the data distribution coming in and the modeling objectives that you're actually building your model for on the output side are changing you know, multiple times, anywhere from you know, every day to every week or every quarter, but either way, you're constantly having to relabel data as a result. And so in these settings, which again, describe most uh, you know, verticals, most settings in the real world, manual data labeling and curation is really just a, you know, a non-starter, even for the largest organizations in the world that, that we've you know, uh, had the, chance, the, the, the you know, amazing opportunity to partner with. It's also, and this is really important to note, and I've actually been having recently some great conversations with folks both on the enterprise, but also especially on the government side where this is, this is really coming into key focus. There are many ethical and governance challenges that are really exacerbated by an AI approach that relies on manual labeling of this, this you know, central data, data set uh, that the model learns from. You know, questions like how do we inspect or correct for biases from human labelers? How do we actually govern or audit a data set of hundreds or thousands or millions of hand-labeled data points? How do we actually trace the lineage of some model error that we observe back to where in the training data set it originated from? In other words, where the model learned it from. And these are all critical challenges that, you know, when you're dealing with a pile of, you know, or usually a massive scale pile of manual labels, you know, is, is technically a, as, a problem that is as hard or harder than the original modeling problem you were trying to solve. In other words, it's not unapproachable, but it's something that in practice you can't really do. You can't deal with these biases. You can't govern and audit. You can't trace lineage when you're dealing on a, a fully manual approach to data-centric AI development. So one of the approaches that uh, we've taken, and now I'll shift from a, uh, a you know, broad spectrum view to uh, an example of a data-centric AI system, as you could have you could have guessed given my t-shirt or the logo that's plastered around this talk, I am indeed going to talk a little, little bit about our platform snorkel flow. But again, uh, less about the specific details. If you're curious, please reach out. And more about the, you know, reflection of the principles we're talking about. And I'm going to skim through it pretty quickly just so we can, we can, you know, get through on time. But in a nutshell, the key idea is to try to raise the abstraction level with, with you know, with which users can interact with this, 
this new center point of development, in other words, the data, and raise it from labeling and curating and slicing and augmenting this data by hand to doing that programmatically. So you can think of as an example, you know, asking a subject matter expert to write some keywords uh, or, or phrases or, or you know, pattern matchers for a document as a really simple example uh, to label rather than just labeling one by one thousands of documents by hand. And as a quick note, this uh, was and still is a project out of the Stanford AI Lab, lots of great government and industry funding and partnerships and deployments and collaboration, uh, about 50 plus peer reviewed publications. We'll see how the NERIPS deadline goes uh, uh, this afternoon. But if you're curious, you can go and uh, check out the stuff on the uh, resources page of uh, snorkel.ai. At a high level, Snorkel Flow, our platform that we're, we're building here at Snorkel, is an instantiation of this idea that uh, data-centric AI development is all about rapid iteration that centers around modifying and labeling and managing your data as the, as the first class citizen of the platform. So there's four basic steps that Snorkel Flow supports. And again, you know, broadly four basic steps that we think are really important to have in a data-centric AI development loop, whether it's Snorkel Flow or, or some other approach. First is some way to actually label and manage your training data and to do so in some programmatic fashion rather than just by hand. Although obviously hybrid approaches are something that we support as well and have published about and are, are often very powerful as well. Second, finding some way to clean up and manage this data and in the snorkel flow setting, uh, specifically cleaning up this programmatic input, which is often uh, messier or weaker as a form of supervision, even though, as it's you know, far more efficient and practical. Then using this to train models and finally closing the loop to actually analyze where are there errors in the model that can be corrected by going back and modifying the data. And so the idea here is not about some push button auto magic shift from having to spend person months labeling data to getting to press a button and do nothing else. It's still a, a fundamental human loop process, but it's about having that loop be, you know, minutes or hours of time spent labeling and managing data rather than person months of manual labeling followed by some model centric development at the end that often uh, can't solve the underlying data problems. And just to skim through very rapidly, you know, at a high level, you know, this labeling, uh, the core abstraction inside snorkel flow is, is this idea of a, of a labeling function. And I think my indentation got messed up, but I, but I, I, I normally uh, do actually know that the indentation is important here. Um, but basic idea is, you know, have a subject matter expert or a data scientist express some piece of knowledge, some pattern or heuristic or external source of signal as a function that labels data rather than purely uh, individually labeling data points by hand. So uh, in snorkel flow, this can be done uh, both via a no-code UI as well as through a Python SDK. And I'll come back to this point at the very end of why this no-code UI is, is a you know, very central piece of making data-centric AI collaborative, as I mentioned in that third principle or hypothesis. Uh, this, you know, essentially uh, serves as an abstraction layer for taking in all sorts of signal types, not just, you know, patterns or heuristics, but cross checks against databases or ontologies or knowledge bases, uh, application of heuristics or legacy systems, other models, other manual uh, labeled data sets that may be uh, somewhat applicable or a bit, but noisy or, or, or slightly offset. All of this stuff can get dumped in through this abstraction of a labeling function and applied. <laughs> Now, once you've done that, uh, once you've shifted from manual labeling to programmatic labeling, you get all the, the commensurate benefits. You can uh, create a training set that is quite large in you know, minutes or hours. You can actually go back and, as you do with any other kind of code, audit and govern and uh, modify and reuse. And in general, you know, have a much more practical and data-centric way of actually doing your AI development. But on the other hand, your programmatic inputs, your labeling functions are likely going to be noisier. They're not going to be 100% accurate. They're not going to cover all the data. This is why, you know, rules-based systems are, are challenging, why we're talking about ML uh, in the first place. Key idea that we worked on a lot on the academic side, um, again, I'll, I'll just skim over, is the idea that you can actually take in these programmatic or, or what are often called weak supervision signals and automatically figure out how to reweight and combine them without separate ground truth. And this is building on you know, many, many years of theory in this area that we uh, made some incremental progress on top of and uh, ends up allowing you to actually write these labeling functions, dump them in, and have the system take care of figuring out which ones are more or less trustworthy, how to adjudicate disagreements, and, and how to deal with this, this more efficient and more practical but noisier form of interfacing with your data. Then uh, 
I'll, I'll be quicker through the rest, but you can train models. You can now train you know, the latest data hungry model architectures. You're training them on your data versus some generic data set that may or may not match your actual uh, inference time or test time conditions. These models can take some amount of the data being labeled and generalize beyond them. So there's an idea here uh, that is, uh, I won't have time to go into depth about, but of actually taking some programmatic labeling of some portion of your data and then provably being able to generalize beyond it. So in other words, taking some of the best of what direct specification or rules-based approaches can do, in other words, being precise, but struggling to cover the long tail of, of diverse unstructured data and bridging that with what machine learning does you know, better and better every day, which is generalization to uh, more diverse data patterns. And one of the cool results also that, that has both empirical and, and theoretical work behind it in a lot of our, our publications over the years is that you can now actually scale at asymptotically you know, roughly the same rate as adding more labeled data, but with unlabeled data. In other words, you can dump in more unlabeled data and take advantage of the volume of unlabeled data that's often present. Think hundreds of thousands of documents or chest x-rays or network signals that are not labeled and are too expensive to label, but you can put them through these, these programmatic labeling um, approaches and actually get similar scaling benefits in terms of model performance. And finally, as I mentioned, a big focus in our actual platform development work with SnorkelFlow is actually being able to be guided prescriptively to, you know, where is my model making some mistake and where in the data can I go to iterate and correct that? Since uh, often there's a, a place in the, in the data that actually corresponds to that error mode that you can just iterate on the labeling functions around and correct. And this is not just for initial development, but it's also very crucially for adaptation to the inevitable changes that happen all the time in production, both with respect to input uh, uh, data set shift or, 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 or distributional drift, as well as output objective shift. You know, the, the line of business team uh, on, on that, you know, you're building the model for decided they need 10 classes instead of five, and you don't want to have to relabel all of your data by hand. Pardon me. Um, and I'll skip over some of these results, but just citing a couple, uh, three peer-reviewed publications with some teams at Google, Intel, Stanford Hospital, the one I mentioned, as well as a couple of uh, anonymous customer case studies, where the impact of this uh, transition from manual labeling to programmatic labeling saved person months to even person years or seven to eight figure sums uh, of, of, uh, of, of spend. And, and that's just on you know, a single modeling problem. So I'll skip by some of these examples and I'll just briefly note, we definitely don't have time for this today, but as you may hear about in some of the talks today, data-centric AI is much more than just labeling. And so even if you just look at some of the work that we've done and that you may hear about from some of the uh, extended snorkel team today, it's not just labeling, it's also uh, transforming or augmenting data. It's slicing and dicing data into the more difficult or important subsets that the model needs to fit to, and all of these other central operations that uh, actually drive progress forward. Okay, and since I'm, I'm running low on time, I'm just gonna very briefly touch on this last point, but it's extraordinarily important. In fact, this is actually the very first DARPA funding that uh, I think paid for me to be working on, on this, this odd thing called snorkel back at Stanford which is that the SME, the subject matter expert who actually knows how to label and curate the data has to be included in the loop. And again, I'll note that the kind of old model centric development way is often this kind of throw it over the wall model where we actually have this very decoupled API between the subject matter expert who's labeling the data and the data scientist who just receives some XY labeled tuples anonymously with no interaction between the two. And again, this has been tremendous for model centric development and, and development of models, but it's it's tremendously impractical and even dangerous in the real world. So in Snorkel Flow, we try to make there uh, be a, a very synchronous workflow between the data scientist and the subject matter expert, as you'll hear from Roshni later today. Um, another perspective that I'll mostly skip over, but is the idea that you know uh, a data-centric approach allows you to actually just take direct subject matter expertise and inject it right in the model, rather than essentially playing this game of 20,000 questions where the model is trying to re-infer uh, features or, or heuristics that the expert knows. And we can even leverage structured forms of knowledge like ontologies as we published about or other knowledge bases directly to train models. So again, I'll wrap up there, I'm at time and uh, really excited for all of you to take a look at the, the great talks and, and content today. Really humbled to have everyone uh, joining us. I see Anima up next. Thank you, Anima, so much again for uh, your time today. And uh, again, if you want more uh, details on the stuff that I covered today that's Snorkel specific, check out the resources page. 
Thank you so much, Alex. What a great way to kick off the day. And thanks for the introduction to data-centric AI as well as Snorkel. Uh, really wonderful first session here.